Thank you. I'm joined most of the speakers in one way. We're allowed to speak today about passions. I've got three academic passions. Number one is disease prevention. That's something that I've worked on for much of my professional life as an academic. The second is what my wife would term an obsession, which is about helping developing countries in whatever way that we can. And third is my abiding passion at the moment, and that's Cambridge University. Five minutes only gives me a chance to talk about the third. Where does the university go to, and what are the challenges the university faces? It's your university, after all. It comes down to one statement, and unusually, it's a functional mission statement. Goodness knows you've seen enough of these. But it's very simple here in Cambridge, and that's to serve society through teaching, learning, and research at the highest international standards of excellence. That's it. No ifs, ands, or buts but actually quite profound in its simplicity. And the challenges stem just from that particular statement. We want to serve society. What do we mean by society? Probably when it was first postulated, people thought East Anglia. Um, now it's not even the UK, probably not Europe, the EU, but actually is a global society. So it means that whatever we do as a university, and here is where it really ties in with the ethos of the, the, the Gates Scholars Programme, is that we need to be out there and ensuring that whatever happens in here is actually of relevance to the wider world. That does not mean no fundamental science, no fundamental research in areas, because I have a second aphorism for you, and it comes from George Porter. There is no such thing as fundamental research. There's only applied research and not yet applied research. In other words, the only reason string theory isn't applied today is because we're not clever enough to think of how to apply it. But believe me, there's some cryptographer somewhere working on the way in which string theory can be applied. The challenges going forward for a university such as Cambridge is where and how fast this university should grow. Uh, we don't talk about league tables here. Actually, we loathe them by and large because they're all self-selected. And remember, you don't sell newspapers if you don't change the leadership of league tables occasionally. There's, there's no news if Harvard continues to finish top of every single league table, or for that matter, if Cambridge finishes top of every league table. However, I am informed by my friends on, in the Cotswolds, shall we say, that actually they do not like the idea that the best address to have in the world is Cambridge. Um, wherever, whichever side of the pond you're actually on. <laughs> the next uh, area that we have to think about is our teaching and learning programs. The undergraduate program, we have a very small undergraduate body, but we invest enormously in that undergraduate body. There are only 3,300 students join us. Those of you who come from North American universities will think that's a large number. By European standard, it is infinitesimally small. My colleagues in Montpellier in France have an average entry into Montpellier of 23,000 a year. So in Europe, far bigger enterprises. We're very small by European standards. And that is why we're endlessly challenged about how we educate and what we deliver. We believe we deliver an exceptional education program, but it throws open the societal challenges of widening participation and access. Who's best going to be able to take advantage of what Cambridge can offer as an undergraduate education? There's a lot of debate about that particular issue at the present time, um, and there are no rights or wrongs to it. But we're absolutely committed to that undergraduate education program. And why are we committed to it? Well, if you want no other measure than the financial one. The university and colleges put in 60 million pounds of revenue a year to top up whatever is brought in, in in the student fee. The student fee doesn't even come close to covering the costs of that undergraduate education. So I'm afraid, as I keep saying to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, we put our money where our mouth is. Uh, let's see the government actually try and do the same. So we're committed, but we're committed to the education models that Cambridge already delivers. For Cambridge to be successful in the future and continuing to be successful, we have to look after the postgraduate population. And postgraduate education is the area where we see growth happening in the future. 
and it is why we're building a billion pounds worth of infrastructure in northwest Cambridge to be able to provide more accommodation closely linked to the collegiate university that we have in the center of the city to make sure that people are not dispersed over the sort of uh, area that happens in many London-based institutions with long commute times for people to actually come in. So that is a real commitment. And we have about 2,000 taught postgraduate students as a whole, 4,400, I think it is, PhDs at the present time. But how we sustain our excellence is a very different community because by North American or any other European standards, we have over 4,000 postdoctoral workers in this university. We only have 1,500 fixed academic staff. So the postdoctoral community is one that I'm particularly keen on, making sure that they're embedded and see themselves as part of this community of scholars at Cambridge. The third element is research. And to do that, we have to attract the very best staff, because they will in turn attract the best postdocs, and we will in turn attract the best PhD students. That's the only model of growth that I know that is sustainable in the longer term for a university such as Cambridge. But to attract the best staff, we have to provide the best facilities. Ha. And here comes the rub. Uh, facilities these days are hugely expensive. Northwest Cambridge will deliver another million square feet of academic space for future development. On the health campus to the south of the city, we already have companies coming in like AstraZeneca that are investing three and a half, uh, uh, 350 million pounds into uh, new facilities. A new hospital being built on that campus site. In fact, the campus site is already full in terms of what's all, uh, uh, available and we have to extend that campus site even further. These are really ambitious plans. To put that into the UK context, no university has ever put proposals for infrastructure growth on the scale that Cambridge is now contemplating. Uh, down at West Cambridge, new material science department opened. That was 60 odd million. Chemical engineering is going up at 60 million plus. And there are more to come. The biggest of all is going to be the Cavendish laboratories because they will need rebuilding. If they are not up to date, we will never and cannot ever hope to aspire to attract the very best staff from around the world. Because here, the game is international competitiveness. And we're right there, and we intend to remain right there uh, in that dimension. And then lastly, there is the fourth challenge. And it's the one that I feel particularly passionate about because it links very much to my third challenge, to my second passion, which is that we have to become a much more international university. Because of our size, and because we don't have the endowments of some of the North American universities, I cannot do what some of our colleagues in North America are doing, and that is to build a very big wall around Cambridge with a drawbridge, pull it up, and say the rest of the world can go hang, uh, we're going to do it our way within our own environment. Cambridge must look outwards to the greater world. And that means that we have to think very hard how we don't compromise our mission, and yet we get that engagement and the opportunity that comes from wider engagement with other countries. And that is dictating our international direction in countries, particularly in India, in Singapore, China, and also in those collaborations with the United States. And it's those collaborations that we'll build. But one I want to leave you with is Africa. Because here the responsibility is very different. We're growing our reputation because of the relationship with some of those countries. But here comes the big one, and the big one that's enshrined in what a Gates scholar is supposed to do. Here we should be giving back. In those countries, we need to ensure that we establish the importance of the principle that tertiary or university-based education really matters. No matter how poor you are as a country, the absence of the concept of tertiary education, which is often critical of governments and critical uh, of organizations in those countries, is an essential part in a knowledge-intensive world of tomorrow to, be, to have a foothold on that ladder of international competitiveness as countries develop. And here the university is engaged in a whole range of programs, unusually for a university, not health orientated particularly, but taking on board veterinary science, law, uh, humanities, 
for instance, looking at maternal mortality, not from the point of view of a medical solution, but of a sociological solution that might, for instance, prevent women getting blood transfusions in the, in the face of postpartum hemorrhage because husbands don't give consent. You know, how do you tackle these problems? These are big issues. And the one thing about Cambridge, just like the rest of you, is we're not frightened of big issues because we have a model that is very bottom-up for individual academics. What we say to them is, we give you one commodity, and most of them say, oh, money, yes, please. <laughs> it's not money that's given away here. What we try to give every academic in Cambridge is time. We want them to have the time not to deal with short-term problems, but to deal with the really long-term issues. And yes, that's the f those are the fields where the Nobel Prizes grow, but they're also the fields where you'll find real solutions to real-world problems because you have the chance to explore them on a far longer time course than is normally given through conventional grant uh, and other funding mechanisms. So I'm hoping to leave you with a picture that, yes, there are challenges. Every institution faces challenges. This institution is better placed than most to find solutions to those challenges, but it's also inherently ambitious, not just for Cambridge, but for that first part of the statement. We're ambitious to be able to serve a global society. And I'm